former people. This is episode one, the first inaugural episode, Redux. Redux because this podcast has existed before with different people. I'd like to introduce our new editorial staff, contributing editor and film writer, Shallon Van Tyne, reviewer, contributing editor, and transcriber? Question mark? P.A. Higgins, and I am your editor slash overlord, C. Derek Varn. And today we're going to talk about modernism, postmodernism, neo-modernism, a bunch of abstractions, what it has to do with art, and why I think that we should ban the word postmodernism from our vocabulary, probably set the word modernism on fire, and why this is a neo-modernist journal, even though none of us really know what that means. All right. Today, starting off, will be Shallon talking to us about, like, what is this, uh, I don't know, modernism and postmodernism stuff? Well, modernism, I, you know, the, first, I think we should clear up the difference between when people say the word modernity versus modernism. Um, modernity is usually a general term that can be used in all sorts of ways, anything from the start of the Renaissance or the you know, the start of the Industrial Revolution or the 20th century. So um, when we're when we're talking about modernism, we're essentially talking about a artistic and literary movement um, from, you know, the early 20th century. But that was influenced by the late 19th century and some key figures there. So modernism is, of course, going to be an umbrella term that houses a lot of different ideas underneath it. And when we get to talking about postmodernism, it's the same kind of idea. It's really a, a term that houses all kinds of political and economic and aesthetic ideas underneath it. Um, so that's why it's kind of hard to speak about those terms in specifics. And... When we when we talk about modernism and philosophy and, and in art, we already have a problem, right? Because as a periodization and in philosophy, uh, modernism actually kind of refers to something very different than it does in art. If you see modernism beginning with De- Descartes in European philosophy, or maybe with who else could we start modernism with? Well... I tend to think, and I, I know I've said this to you before, but I like to think of the four horsemen of modernism. You have Nietzsche, Darwin, Marx, and Freud as kind of the predecessors to the modernist movement. Uh, and why I group those four together is that they all uh, appended these long-held paradigms, centuries-long paradigms, um, that no longer apply to society anymore. And that, that sort of thing uh, influenced then the artistic tradition that would later become modernism. Um, you know, Nietzsche, for example, he, he really stated that, you know, after, after we have Darwin, um, you know, all the philosophy up until that point had been framed in a very, um, theistic worldview, even up through Hegel, um, and, and, you know, the, the philosophers who, um, you know, are really sort of innovative in the sense that, you know, they're really changing our, our perceptions of the world, even up through Hegel, um, these philosophers are still writing from this sort of view that the world has been created by a god and so Nietzsche is like look we need to revisit this after Darwin because once Darwin comes into the picture once we have um, the concept of evolution those sorts of old world views no longer apply Um, and this and this can be said the same for you know Marx and Freud these are people who who showed us that no longer do we have to depend on these institutions of the past, you know, the church, the state, uh, these sorts of things are, are not as solid as we used to think of them. And now things can be explained in terms of a system. You have natural selection or you have the will to power, or class struggle or the unconscious. These are ways of thinking about the world in systems. These are going to be the predecessors to 
the artistic movement that will want to break with tradition. Because one of the key ideas behind modernism is rejecting tradition, rejecting centuries old tradition and starting with something new. I would agree with that. The, the only conception I would say is that in philosophy proper, modernism starts around somewhere between Dun Scotus and Descartes. And you really get the ending of, you know, Aristotelian and Platonic, you know, philosophy proper, right? But it's not really till Marx, Nietzsche, Freud, Darwin, that you really get the break that I think would lead to literary modernism. So I, I still agree with your periodization. I just think this even just further illustrates the confusion in trying to talk about this. There's there's other fun stuff, like a lot of people begin postmodernism with an essay by Nietzsche that's not even in anything. It's actually a fragment of an uh, that he didn't publish. It was it Truth and Lies in the in the non moral sense, I believe is what it is. And so you also have the origins of quote postmodernism immediately upon the origins of modernism. Now the thing is I'm using postmodern modernism here in the colloquial way that it's commonly used, but what we really should be referring to is post-structuralism, high modernism, linguistic turn, common language philosophy, even though that's its analytic form. Um, these are trends in continental and analytic philosophy that break from the traditional like logical empirical divide, um, which already had begun the breakdown with the German idealist. You can see already, again, you don't really have one clear thing you're talking about. And so when people talk about postmodernism, they'll include people who were writing against the very people that are also considered postmodernists. Right. Um, I, you know, I tend to I tend to think of postmodern. Well, I'll, let me back up. I often see people refer to postmodernism as they, they use it as a shorthand for relativism or skepticism. Um, but that's really not what postmodernism is. There are relativist and skeptic, skeptical elements of postmodernism. Um, but, you know, relativism and skepticism, those are philosophical concepts that have existed long before postmodernism. And postmodernism is a historically context concept. So really with postmodernism, I like to think of it in not only as an umbrella term, but as a historical condition, not, not some sort of prescriptive philosophy, but as a historical condition. And also, I, I like to think of it more broken down into three different categories. You have postmodernism in the arts, which is, um, and, and these categories overlap, but you have postmodernism in the arts, which, um, is largely stylistic. Um, you have, linguistic postmodernism, which is like you mentioned, you're starting to deal with things like the cultural turn and post-structuralism and that sort of idea. Um, and then you have so, uh, societal postmodernism, which is, you know, the, the types of theorists who are dealing with the problems of late capitalism. So these, this is kind of how in my mind, and these are still again, very broad categories, but I think when we're talking about postmodernism, we have to be clear, you know, what kind of postmodernism we're actually talking about. Agreed. I, I just personally don't like using the term. Um, <laughs> I mean, like, so. Me neither, I, actually. <laughs> um, when I was first writing, uh, in undergrad, when postmodernism in quotation marks was, more hip than it is now because I'm old, um, which is basically by the time it had worked its way out into state schools outside of, you know, the central cores of academia, which have been the late 90s, early aughts, we were already trying to figure out what it was artistically because you knew what modernism was more or less, but tried to take a high modernist author like Borges and then compare him to a postmodernist author like Ishmael Reed and it was hard to actually find the clear distinction. Similar with someone like Joyce and Beckett. Joyce is considered high modernist. Beckett's considered by some people high modernist, by some people postmodernist. Joyce, Joyce and Beckett are, you know, are like the yin and yang of Irish experimental literature. But what's unique to them that you don't find in other places? When you go back and read early modern and late medieval literature, for example, the self referentiality and the artifice is already there. I mean, you know, 
The second book of of um, Don Quixote by Cervantes plays on the fact that there are pirated copies of the first book of Don Quixote in the world, in the world of the book. So there are people commenting on Don Quixote in the book itself. I mean, these are the kinds of games you expect with like postmodernism, and they're already there in like pre-modern works or early modern works. Um, another example of this, which everybody loves, is Tristram Shanty. That that book is nutty. There, there's the late medieval use of frame stories within frame stories and, you know, mixing of tone. I mean, Chaucer is moving from high to low literature like crazy. Shakespeare does it, too. So these things that we consider postmodern, to me, in literature, they seem to be all found in things that were just excluded from modernism, but do not necessarily contradict it in any way. I'll give you another example of this. Virginia Woolf's Orlando, postmodern or modernist? Clearly modernist in terms of time period, but it's metafictive. You have you have a gender bending character who changes gender throughout time for no explained reason and is commenting on their own story throughout. That that meets most of the traits of postmodernism, but it can't be because postmodernism as liter as a historically situated literary periodization didn't exist yet. Nor is it clear to me. Um, when we talk about postmodernism, how any of these ideas completely come from linguistic postmodernism or poststructuralism in, in philosophy, or even the other various artistic movements in the plastic arts. And plastic arts, I just mean like painting, uh, sculpture, etc., um, like pop art or whatever. There isn't a, a, a consistent set of traits. And so when I wanted to uh, start a journal um, with Steve McAlcoff that included experimental, but also somewhat conventional literature, literature that kind of fit modernist tropes, I couldn't call it postmodern because A, I mean, people have been doing that for 50 years, and B, I couldn't decide on what postmodernism really was. I think that one thing that's um, interesting that was brought up is that it was mentioned that like there's a kind of popular turn towards talking about postmodernism these movements are symptomatic of their time. It's a reflection of the broader kind of conditions of what's going on, which I think is true to a certain point. You know, it's kind of a popular thing since Frederick Jameson especially popularized that account. You know, postmodernism is a reflection of late capitalism. And I think that's also true with like modernity. There's a certain sense that like modernism as this reflection of a new kind of subjectivity, a new kind of understanding of an interconnected world that's appearing. But then you kind of run into issues with that because, okay, again, you have this thing that's like, does modernity begin with the quote unquote discovery of the quote, quote, new world? Because we've suddenly opened up the entirety of the geographical world as we understand it for the most part. Is it beginning with some sort of conception of capitalism and acceleration and a technological advancement? Is it in uh, some section of late medieval disintegrating England? Is it an absolutism politically? And I, I think this is kind of where I, I don't necessarily follow the conception of modernism if it has any coherence as strictly a movement in that sense, because you run into questions of like, well, is Arthur Rimbaud a modernist if he's not really attached to any movement per se? And it's hard to say that he really had any kind of like explicit manifesto of what he was trying to do. He just happens to be a poet that a lot of people draw on as being evocative of a certain kind of uh, modern uh, conception, modern tone that was going on. I mean, and again, like someone like Cervantes is Gargantuan Pantagruel, a modernist work. It's dealing with urbanism and satirizing uh, institutions of a time that were once sacred. And that's the other thing is that this idea of systemization is also interesting because at the same time, this modern world is precisely the point at everything that seems to have its role in place is breaking down. And much of these concepts of system are also tied to the idea that there's randomization and chaos and individual atomic things going around without any clear control, even if they have tendencies. And even someone like Nietzsche, he has a genealogy, but he's also famously heralded as a unsystemic, systemic thinker in a way. Marx says that all that is solid melts into air, but also is seeking out these structures and things that are outside of anyone's hands. So I think it's, it is kind of every which way you turn, there's some sort of contradiction, which is, you know, 
overly used weighty term that's used to add gravitas to nonsense now. But when you run against that with postmodernism, yeah, that is kind of the question. And then you have sort of like, you know, pop postmodernism now, you know, you have something like House of Leaves, which is actually quite a good book, but it, it does have that sense of like, it's intentionally quoting Derrida and stuff somewhat like tongue in cheek and trying to appeal to this kind of turn towards people are now talking about postmodernism. So you make works that are postmodernist. Um, there is something to me of a sort of gravitas or anguish or an attempt to try and get at some sort of essence of things more common to what we might call the quote modernist period and then has some sort of flavorful shift aesthetically in the post modernist period. I, I, I've never found a particularly good way of like expressing it. Baudrillard and uh, libidinal economy people do have a sort of anguish to them. And that's in a philosophical sense, but also sometimes in a literary sense. But it feels very different to me than talking about some of them like Adorno and what they're, what they're, or Kierkegaard and what they're trying to explain and get at in terms of the, the anguish of the, the modern world and experience. Yeah. So a couple things on that. Um, one, I, I would, I would make a distinction, you know, if we're, if we're going to try and make distinctions, of course, um, with iffy terms. Um, but I would make a distinction between the satire of modernism and the pastiche of postmodernism, because, um, while pastiche seems satirical, it tends to lack the, um, parody that that actual satire hat so you know and jameson talks about this pastiche um really celebrates rather than you know paradises or, or or mocks um the thing that it's imitating so um there's a much more superficial quality um when you're dealing with pastiche and if you want to use that that's one distinction between you know modernism and postmodernism, at, at least in the um aesthetic and, and literary sense. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention too is, you know, part of the problem with this is that we are talking about these sorts of quote unquote movements um, in the present, looking backwards. And the problem with that is that these are movements, both modernism and postmodernism, um, are things that only really made sense in the time that they were happening. So it's not like we can reproduce um, modernism now, um, because we're already past that point. We're, we're already in the point of a postmodern world. And, you know, there, there are people who are saying how we're in post postmodern world and we don't even need to go into all that. But like, um, the point is that when the modernist artists and writers are, and, and composers, I will also say, uh, when they are creating their works, they are doing something incredibly new and innovative at the time. Um, it doesn't make sense to really reproduce those characteristics now because they're no longer innovative. Um, and so if we think of it like that, if we think of it in a historical sense, uh, these, these artists are, are totally breaking with centuries old tradition and, and they're, tr and they're taking their work seriously. So that's another distinction. Even though they have play and satire in their works, um, their intention is to make a very serious distinction between high and low culture. Now, whether or not they were able to do that effectively is a different question. And, and whether or not that actually existed is also a different question, but, their ideas were to be serious about their art. When you get into the postmodern period, you get into the sort of Warhol version of, you know, being playful about it. And um, a lot of that comes with a lot of the postmodern culture comes with the advent of mass media. So one way to think about postmodernism is to think of it in terms of mass culture. We really start to see the, the roots of mass culture going back to the 20s, but it's really in the post-war years, post-World War II, that you have uh, mass media really taking hold and the world becoming this sort of global um, place. Um, and that's where you have um, advertising being conflated with art, 
Um, and these sorts of separations between high and low culture become collapsed. And there's, there's no such thing as a separation between high and low culture anymore. In fact, I, you know, like some of my students, I try to kind of explain this stuff. Um, and they don't even have the concept, you know, these younger generations, they don't have the concept of a separation between high and low culture. They've never lived in a world where those were two separate spheres. Um, so this is one of those problem this is one of those historical problems where we're thinking about these sorts of things in 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 terms of the present trying to ascribe characteristics to them but really we have to think about about them in their historical context because it's not the kind of thing that can be reproduced you know what i mean so why why would anyone try to i, I guess in some ways there's a an anthology of poetry it came out about a decade ago. It's called Hybrid something. It was about the end of the distinction between uh, MFA and experimental and poetry and all that. Um, and part of that's for market pressures. There, there really isn't enough market for for um, experimental poetry and like common poetry and performance poetry to be totally separate. And I wonder how much effect that has on our categorizations here. Another thing I think that we tend to maybe, and this is more specific to literature, but not to deal with is there is some truth to the idea that the MFA kind of killed off the need for, for movements as ways to train up and protect and get artists out. The function of movements as ways to network, as ways to train up artists, find readers, sort of has been academicized um, in a way that also makes some of these periodizations and distinctions somewhat irrelevant. I mean, you, you do have things like uh, like House of Leaves with Mark Danieleski, um, but even that was 20 years ago. And his his books are not, they're not uh, read as much or at all, <laughs> uh, um, or his subsequent books. And you also have weird cases where, like, you have writers like uh, Jonathan Franz and um, David Foster Wallace, who people love to hate on these days, who, are they postmodernist? Are they modernist? I mean, all the ambitions of both Franz and Anne Wallace were pretty much in the modernist American novel tradition. Some of their techniques, a lot of their techniques are not. I mean, uh, with, with Wallace, you had hyperrealism, you had the self-awareness of form. You had absurdity and satire with Franzen. Well, Franzen is a little bit more conventional, actually, but you had some of that. And it seems pretty clear to me that that meaning doesn't, if there, if it still had meaning, those authors were the last chance for it to have meaning. People from Laurie Moore to uh, George Saunders. Um, to name drop. But right now, it seems to be that the concerns of modernism are still pretty much alive and well, but they're in genre fiction. And there's also less of a distinction between genre fiction and literary fiction for a couple reasons there, too. Again, the MFA um, and things like uh, Clarion Writers Workshop and genre fiction workshops, they are the, the distinctions between them have decreased over time. Um, and it seems to me that all these pressures have broken down a lot of these boundaries, some of which were from experimental pressures, some of which I think actually probably have to do with market share pressures, the increased need for, for, um, for an author to be able to sell to different, uh, niche demographics that you could have probably made a career off of just serving one in the past. And I also think there is a certain amount of of ways that um, exposure to education through the internet has made some of the cultural capital associated with certain kinds of authorial work. And uh, PH might really like to talk on this because PH is our Pierre Bourdieu person. Mm -hmm. But there's a certain kind of cultural capital that is no longer associated with this because the access limits, you know, you just have to go to college to discover a lot of this stuff. And now, I mean, it's always been in the bookstore, but you want to look for it. And that's just not as true anymore. I mean, less so now, but 10 years ago, you go to any number of like literary blogs and read all this stuff. 
you know, just real quick, you mentioned David Foster Wallace and is he modernism? Is he postmodernism? Uh, you know, I think many people tend to think of him as postmodernism, but I believe he thought of himself as trying to perpetuate the modernist tradition. Um, you know, infinite jest, if you, if you even look at his tome, that was, you know, his attempt at making his own Ulysses. And even if you read his earlier essays before he came out with infinite jest, you know, one of his, his essays, E Unibus Forum, which is essentially kind of the overall thesis of infinite jest in essay form, if you don't want to read through 800 pages. Uh, <laughs> he is essentially calling for what would later be called the new sincerity, which is he's rejecting the MTV sort of tradition of his generation, of Generation X, which is, you know, high postmodern generation. And MTV is the perfect example of that. Uh, visually. It's all pastiche. It's all advertising. Again, younger generations may not realize this because they've never seen MTV <laughs> and its roots. But, um, you know, when he's writing that essay, he, he's, he's lamenting, um, the, the way that literature has gone into this postmodern phase. And he wants to get back to a, a very, um, serious writing style. Um, a very modernist kind of writing style. And, and, you know, later that would be called the new sincerity that would be taken up by sort of older millennials. But, um, but yeah, even though his works very, seem very postmodernist, it, he's in his mind trying to mimic the, the modernist tradition. But of course, again, this gets into that historical piece because, you know, he's living within a postmodern time, you know, and it's, so it's sort of odd to, to write modernist literature like that. There's inevitable paradox to that, just that kind of like basic fact that you only have the culture to draw on that's existed prior to your point of coming into your own. And you're using that to comment on your contemporary time and contemporary experience. So there's an inevitable feeling of neo uh, prefix whatever to almost anything that you do because you, is it possible to say like once you brand it as okay we're going to say that people have come up with the term postmodernism part of what makes it so weird is that postmodernism is so often described as that feeling of like there's nothing new under the sun so it, it kind of gets lumped into this kind of whirlpool of if i draw and say oh well i'm using a modernism to critique postmodernism am i playing again into some sort of postmodern phase of, oh, well, you're just putting on the clothes of the past. Yeah. I think, I mean, one of the things that uh, when I initially decided to call this journal Neo-Modernism and uh, a Neo-Modernist journal, and I named it Former People, and I named it Former People as kind of a sick joke people who know there's a book called former people and i've discussed this before about uh all the d-class aristocrats in the soviet union who were categorized as former people while they were still alive and i had this sort of feeling that this kind of art that was not and you know not explicitly anti-political or apolitical but not explicitly political not um not also super glib there, I, I felt for a while there was a trend, particularly in the early, in the, from the nineties up through the aughts into the early aught teens, that there was a trend of glibness in poetry and fiction, really. And like it had come out of postmodern metafiction, but it, I don't know. I, I felt like it was, there was a thinness. And when I would read, um, genre fiction, and you can see this in an essay I published on the, on the site, oh, wow, probably eight years ago, actually, six years ago, six years ago, called um, The Weird as New Modern, that the distancing allowed by genre allowed for some of these subjects to be treated more seriously than the conventions of uh, standard literary fiction where there was no genre dis uh, distancing um, between the author in the same way. And I'm not the only person to know. I mean, people like Michael Chabon um, have noticed this. And so I thought, neo-modernism, let's make the old new new again, which is, you know, modern new, but modernism is old for us. 
neo modern, new, and I and I called it neo modern as opposed to meta modernism. And again, this is more the realm of uh, PH's wheelhouse, but because I thought that we wanted to revive some of that spirit of modernism with the knowledge that it would never be the same because of historical context for how modernism came to be, as Shallon said, the specific kinds of mass culture, the lack of stuff like television in the same way. There's just all kinds of things that we wouldn't, we could, we would not and could not engage with anymore. So if there was a, a new modernism, it would be new. It would be effectively a separate thing, even by going, trying to go back to the past. But as the journal continued to exist, I realized that pretty much neo-modernism just became whatever I and Stephen liked. There wasn't really a strong criteria to base the entire enterprise off of. Like, I couldn't say that this is these are the traits of modernist literature I want us to focus on, um, as opposed to these other ones that I don't. Well, I think that may be... It, it, it's. I think it's that contradiction of knowing that there is a definitive shift towards something that we can call mass culture, that there is a mass production of culture. At the same time, there's very clear, I think, continuing questions of distinction in taste, uh, distinction in terms of what you get to learn and have access to uh, um, in the cultural realm. I, I think a lot about just my own background as someone who went to a fancy liberal arts school and the things that I was like, oh, I'm going to be so excited that I get to talk about this kind of stuff and very clear appeals in my own early kind of poetry and things I was doing that were these kind of, yeah, like glib, not really understanding the context of what I was drawing on attempts to be, you know, the next James Joyce. Uh, like, I'm, I'm going to take a bit of this style and a bit of this style and make them kiss and bash them together into into a page. And, and, and that was still very much tied up in this kind of sense of distinction. And, and that at the same time, you know, as you grow as someone who is creating and playing with style and trying to actually hopefully engage with something that is more fulfilling or what have you, there's, there's still the need to distinguish yourself. If you're going to try and do anything new, it has to have some sort of distinction to it. It, it. As you can tell that I'm struggling with the way I'm phrasing stuff, because I think it's often been pointed out that one of the ironies of most like modernism is that there tends to be a sort of like inability to talk about it. There's a spiritual quality to a lot of it, even in like left wing ones, you know, the surrealists. There's this kind of weird, they don't want to talk about it in the most material terms. You have to talk about it as some sort of essence or feeling. You have to talk about it it's often been noted that there's a kind of aristocratic sense to being someone who wants to be a modernist, to try and talk about things as you're breaking from the crowd, you're trying something new, um, even as it's happening in the midst of the interconnecting world. That's one of the things that I think about a lot is just that definitively live in a world with a different kind of mass culture. I don't want to get in trouble and go too much into it, but I work in marketing and it's it's very strange because there's mass culture, but there's also ever more attempt to segment and develop uh, demographics, develop audiences that you can point to and say, these people are not like these people. They have different tastes. They have different uh, things that they desire and that they want. These people are going to look at these people differently. And it both has seemed to kind of do a melting pot with a lot of these kind of ideas of form, um, themes, and what have you, but at the same time, things that have almost more demographic focus, like I would say most genre fiction is highly oriented as a very demographic-based kind of publishing, is also a, a strange realm of experimentation and appeals to a different kind of feeling, a different kind of uncertainty about certain tendencies in modern, in modern, postmodern, whatever have you world. Yeah. So a couple things on that, the Frankfurt School, and th this is a, this is the kind of thing that uh, I've tried to clarify with people before, which is that, you know, the Frankfurt School were, of course, really seated in the modern tradition and uh, especially Adorno. Adorno was, uh, I mean, keep in mind, he was first, um, his goal was to be a composer, and he was a composer um, in the modernist tradition um, before um, becoming, you know, the theorist that he became. And 
even after he became a theorist, he reviewed high modern culture, you know, operas and symphonies. So sometimes I've heard uh, people say, oh, well, you know, Adorno likes that weird modern music. And <laughs> that sort of makes me cringe um, because if, if you don't have sort of a background in music theory, um, the music can all sound weird to you. Um, and, you know, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, when, when you were first writing some of your poetry, you were sort of smashing things together. And I think that there needs to be a clear distinction here between, you know, things just being experimental for being experimental sake um, versus a, a particular prescribed um, modernist technique and tradition. I mean, we can look at music specifically. Um, in the modernist period, music um, changed drastically and it, 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 it also rejected um, the musical tradition of romanticism. And um, when you have things like 12 tone music and atonal music that comes about in the modernist period, these are not just, you know, oh, they're just starting to make weird music or it's just all sporadic or anything like that. That's, that's not what those are. The 12 tone technique means you have to actually compose uh, your compositions using all 12 notes of the chromatic scale, you know, through, through what's called tone rows. So these are actually very serious and very complicated and precise musical compositions. To compare it, when you get into the postmodern tradition in music, uh, you, you get people like John Cage who are dealing with things like chants um, in music, and it's it's much less composed. So my point in bringing up that example, not only to talk about Adorno, but also is to show that even though these things sound strange and experimental, there is a very distinct intellectual distinction between them. And this is the same for a lot of the isms that we have in, in the arts during the modern period, uh, or during the modernist period, I should say. You know, things like surrealism was specifically influenced by Freudian psychology. And, you know, if you did not have Freudian psychology, you probably would, you know, the advent of um, Freudian psychology, you probably would not have surrealism as an art form, um, because it was a specific tradition that worked specifically on dream logic. Um, now, in the postmodern world, we, of course, have art that embraces those surrealistic tendencies and stuff. Um, but the, the point is that there were actual techniques that many of these artists and writers used. Um, to use James Joyce, for example, people think stream of consciousness, okay, this is just random, you know, um, whatever thoughts come into your head. That can be true, but James Joyce was also high modernist because he was making tons of allusions to classic literature. Um, if you did not have a intellectual background in um, all of the classics, uh, tons of the classics, reading things like Ulysses would be impossible because one of the things about modernism is that you are referencing all the tradition that you're also rejecting. And one last thing I'll say on that is that, uh, like PH said, you know, postmodernism is something that's really comes out of um, mass culture. Um, and I, I would just point to the fact that there's a lot of people who I hear talk about postmodernism in philosophical terms as if it's as if it was a bunch of theorists who are, you know, giving some sort of prescriptive philosophy on like, you know, this is how things should be postmodernism. I haven't read any of the any of the postmodern philosophers I've read, none of them have been happy about postmodernism. So I'm not really sure where that comes from. You know, it's much better to think of postmodernism as a as a condition and these postmodern theorists as analyzing this condition um, rather than giving any sort of prescriptive philosophy. So, you know, going back to the Frankfurt School, people like Adorno and some of the early Frankfurters they were analyzing what they were seeing as the rise of postmodern culture before it was even called that. You know, they were critiquing mass media, mass culture, as it was pretty much happening after World War II. Um, then when you would get into the 
you know, the cultural theorists who are dealing with structuralism versus post-structuralism, and you start getting ling- linguists who are looking at meaning in language, then you get into people who are also criticizing postmodern culture, but from a, a, a different angle. So I think one key thing, if we're going to separate modernism versus postmodern, like PH said, it's, you know, mass culture is is one of the key distinctions. I will only complicate that with the fact that mass culture of of modernism, at least in poetry, it seems alien to us now. Read The Wasteland. There are there are references to obscure things. There's references to Welsh literary traditions and epic sagas. There's references to Buddhist scripture. There's also references to common songs. And so even in modernism, these traits um, seem to have been there. The difference, to, I think the difference that's real is in kind. And you do see a changing of the level of assumed education. And again, I, I will go back to general literature. If I'm reading something today that is likely to be based off of the Iliad, the Odyssey, or classical literature, it's not as likely to be literary fiction or common poetry. Although poetry, you see a little bit more of it. Um, why not literary fiction? Because, well, I don't know, but it seems like, particularly since the 80s and even more so since the New Sincerity Movement, most literary fiction is about the affairs of professors. That may sound uncharitable, but I, I've read several award-winning collections, and it's basically like stultified life shit. This, of the kind of thing that actually Wonder Boys, the, uh, the, the novel by... Um, Michael Chabon was making fun of, which is which is a weird, meta, a, a not obviously metafictive novel about a second novel, but actually totally is, and the movie's even more so. And I think the distinction you propose, Shalon, is, is fair, and it's real, but it also still brings back that you're dealing with degrees of kind, not of uh, style. I also say, like, it's also just not true that it, even, even after... Um, uh, modernism that the experiment the experimentation was only for its own sake i i, I will say though I keep thinking about dadaism yeah i keep saying I, I keep thinking that like dadaism throws that off and no one considers that not modernist futurist but, noise are uh, music yeah so th- that's you know that's one of the things is you know people tend to sort of look at these as you know oh they're weird and experimental um, so are they modernist or postmodernist? I, I still would say that if we're going to have these sorts of categories, which again, we already admitted that these categories are a bunch of overlap in gray area, but, um, you know, data is tradition stems does, you can in, see influence in postmodernism from that. But I think one of the things about data is, is that they were very serious. And you can see the seriousness with a lot of these movements, such as surrealism and dataism, by the fact that they all had manifestos, the futurist manifesto, the dataist manifesto. Um, you can read all these and they outline specifically the seriousness of their movement. When you get into the postmodern period and, and you get these sorts of pastiche kinds of arts, there's, there's no manifesto behind them. They're, they're very superficial. And I don't mean that to say that, you know, they're not good or anything. Um, that's a, a sort of different question. But, um, the fact is that they are, um, they're not built upon a serious philosophy. And and whether you think that their philosophy was solid or not is, is again, another, another question. But their intention, the dataist intention, the surrealist intention, the futurist intention, was a very serious philosophy in the arts. I mean, I agree with you, like, these sorts of categories you know, are become kind of meaningless if you break them down too deeply. And of course, all categories are really meaningless if you break them down too deeply. They're just frameworks to help us understand. But, um, you know, one thing that I would say is that the, the difficulty with trying to define postmodernism is that at some points in time, postmodernism is a rejection against modernism. But at other points in time, it's an extension of it. So when you get to things like data, 
you can see where postmodernism is somewhat of an extension of those ideas. You can see where you're talking about the uh, references to common folk culture. You see that in the music too, as well, and in modernist music. Many composers uh, reference folk songs of their day and try to elevate them to a serious compositional style. Um, so in many ways, postmodernism is trying to reject some of these things. But in many ways, postmodernism is an extension of it. You mentioned earlier identity with Orlando, and Joyce, of course, plays with uh, these sorts of identity rules, too. Um, but these get, I would say, more extended in the postmodern world um, when you get to these much more fluid identities. And, and uh, I could even say transhumanism is probably a little bit more postmodern um, than the kind of gender identity and, and fluidity that they're playing with in the modern period. I keep thinking about with Dada or futurist noise music or something, I was thinking about that with the relationship to John Cage. It struck me that I think that what's interesting to me is that the groups like the Dadaists or certain members of the Dadaist tradition, their seriousness is in part due to their commitment to the sort of unseriousness of their art. Um, the true random chaotic nature, they sort of, you know, we're going to take the piss out of everything that's considered uh, high and noble. And at the same, and then like John Cage is also like someone who's, you know, definitively got this randomness to what he's doing. But John Cage in a way is a little bit more serious about his art, but he's not as serious about his like connection to the idea of like it being related to a transformation of the social world, transformation of, uh, you know, some connect, some idea of there being like this, like, total overhaul of what's going on like i think he's a much more he's very serious about like the theory of his music the idea of like what he's doing musically the relationship of the listener to the production of the sound the experimental scores but he's not quite as seriously invested in the same way to me as the way that tristan zara is thinking about the social world at the cusp of the 20th century but maybe that's just me and I don't know what quite to make of that in a, in a way, too, because it seems to fall into these kind of subjective questions of feeling. It almost feels like you end up just kind of being like, it's an attitude, which it always feels like really dissatisfying to some, to some extent. So what does that leave us? If you're asking, you know, where this leaves us in terms of, you know, this conversation, I think that, you know, terms like modernism and postmodernism, you know, the reason that we don't really use them that much, like we said in the beginning, is that, for, well, for one, they're umbrella terms. They, they house a lot of different ideas underneath them. But for two, uh, they are so difficult to pin down. And like I was mentioning earlier, sometimes postmodernism is an extension. Sometimes it's a rejection of modernism. Um, and so it's kind of weird to refer to these things that you can't have clear definitions to what you're referring to you know if, if that sort of leaves us to where we began which is in my view it's kind of hard to use these ter these terms because they're loaded terms let's just say it like that and with loaded terms we should end this off today hopefully you found this first discussion illuminating and we will return we will be talking about movies of memory next time 